Good morning, and welcome to our video devotion for Saturday, September the 25th, 2021. I hope that you're having a pleasant weekend. It's always a joy of mine to be able to share these devotions with you. Now, today we're going to be looking at one of the most familiar of Jesus' parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's found in your Bibles in Luke chapter 10, beginning with the 25th verse. So if you'd like to turn there, that's Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Now, interestingly, this story begins, like so many of Jesus' parables, with a question. Look at what it says. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, we don't know who this man was, but we do know some things about him. Luke identifies him as being an expert in the law. Now, this could mean that he was a priest, but that's kind of unlikely. In all probability, he was a Pharisee. Pharisees were laypersons who were dedicated to submitting themselves completely to God's law. We also know this man asked the right question. What must I do to be saved? And he asked the right question of the right source, the one and, the one and only Son of the living God, Jesus the Christ. But I want you to notice how Jesus takes this question and flips the script on this man. Notice what he says in verse 26. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Now I want you to notice again what Jesus is doing here. He's taking the man back to God's Word. Jesus is not only reminding the man that the answers to every spiritual question can be found in the pages of the Bible, he's also getting ready to teach this man an important spiritual truth. So notice what it goes on to say in verse 27. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This man knew what the law said. He had dedicated his whole life to knowing and applying the law that God revealed to Moses. Part of that law included the foundational truth of Judaism, which was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The Bible is stressing here the oneness of God. And the Bible also taught that loving and serving God with the totality of your being was both the highest privilege and the greatest responsibility of being a child of God. Well, because this man had supplied the right answer, Jesus was delighted. Notice what he says in verse 28. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You know, it's easy to look at this question as the reply of a man who was feeling trapped. But I don't think that's what was going on here. The question of who was to be considered your neighbor was a hot topic among the Jews of Jesus' day. Remember, the Jews in that time were people who were living under an occupying army, the Romans, and they were surrounded by their enemies on every side. Because of this, some Jews had decided that the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself only applied to other Jews. It, thinking that way freed them to strike back against the Roman soldiers with acts that would be considered terrorism today. And it allowed them to harbor feelings of hatred towards anyone who was outside the tribe. You know, many Christians today wrestle with the same kinds of issues. They talk about the importance of Christian love and the need of fellowship with others while harboring feelings of jealousy, mistrust, and hatred towards people who are not like themselves. And who is my neighbor? Who should I love? And who can I ignore? Well, that brings Jesus to the parable itself. So we read beginning in verse 30. A man, who is undoubtedly a Jew, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. You know, it's easy to see this priest and this Levite as the villains in this story. They saw a fellow Jew 
bloodied, beaten, and possibly dead lying on the side of the road, and they went out of their way not to care for their neighbor. But this tr parable doesn't lend itself to such simple stereotypes. In any event, the expert in the law would have not seen the priest and the Levites as bad guys. He would have seen them as being obedient to a higher law that said you must then loving your neighbor as yourself. Now remember, the priest and the Levite were officials in the temple. They had been set apart by God to minister and serve God in the daily temple worship. Their greatest obligation was to God, not fellow human beings. And here's the thing. Before anyone could enter the temple and perform their sacred duties before God, the priest and the Levite would have had to go through a lengthy and complicated ritual of purification. It was something that could take 10 days to two weeks. It was a purification ritual which would have been rendered null and void if they had had any contact with blood or a dead body. To put it another way, the priest and the Levite faced a decision when they encountered their fellow Jew crumpled on the side of the road. They could stop and care for the man and fail in their responsibility to serve God, or serve God and refuse to be contaminated by the man lying in the ditch. Well, the priest and the Levite made a decision that the expert in the law undoubtedly would have agreed with. They passed by the injured man and continued continued on their journey to Jerusalem and their sacred responsibilities at the temple. Well, here's where Jesus turns all the experts' assumptions on his, the, his heels. Notice what it says. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and, on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an end, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for, the extra ex for any extra expense you may have. Now, obviously, this was an act of extraordinary love and grace. It required a good bit of risk. The road from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho was notoriously dangerous. It cut through the Judean desert. It was a no man's land, a place where thieves and murderers preyed on unsuspecting travelers. It, re it was an act that required sacrifice. Remember, the Samaritan paid for the injured man's care out of his own pocket. And it required a commitment of time. The Samaritan interrupted his own plans to care for this Jewish man. But to really understand the point Jesus is making, you have to focus on the source of this compassion and love, a Samaritan man. To the expert in the law who had approached Jesus, this story about the Samaritan was simply outside his frame of reference. To the expert in the law, the Jews were the good guys. Samaritans were half-breeds and heretics who were objects of hatred and scorn. It's almost like Jesus has placed this unquest uncomfortable question in the mind of the expert in the law. It would have gone like this. If you had been beaten and left for dead, who would you be, have been thankful for? The men of God rushing to the temple to perform their religious duties or the Samaritan who cared for this man's needs? You know, if you put it like that, it's sort of a no-brainer, isn't it? The priest and the Levite had fulfilled their religious obligations under the law. The Good Samaritan had fulfilled the God-given responsibility to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, a lot of Christians today fall into this same trap. They are so busy trying to fulfill their religious responsibilities, they forget to care for their neighbors, for people who are in need. It's interesting. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 through 21, the Bible says, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates his brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, it's so easy to get involved with life that we forget to care. It's so easy to get caught up in, in religious devotion that we forget to go out of our way to attend to the needs of others. Father, help us to remember that in loving you, we should love our neighbor, and that loving our neighbor is a way of loving you. Father, give us the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight, and the opportunities to share, care for others in Jesus' name. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I always get a, such a blessing studying Jesus' parables, and I hope this parable has blessed and challenged you today. I also want to encourage you to come to church tomorrow. Sunday school begins at 9.15. Morning worship begins at 9.30. Don't forget we're having a special luncheon honoring uh, Carolyn Sears and Gary Goodrum as they prepare to get married. So come to church and plan to stay for a great time of fun, food, and fellowship. Now, if you're not able to be here tomorrow, remember that the morning worship hour will be live streamed beginning at 10.20. You can go to visit by going to Sunset Road's Facebook page or by logging on to youtube.com and typing in Sunset Road Baptist Church in the search box. Well, until tomorrow, have a safe, peaceful, and happy day. I love you. Bye-bye.